Good evening, it's Tuesday the 31st of May. Tonight we take a look at China's growing role in the Pacific. Just how far will Beijing push its diplomatic relations with the island nations in the months and years to come? And how will the Australia's, Australia's new government respond? Tonight I'll talk with journalists and experts across the region about China's long-term ambitions in our part of the world. O'Connor and welcome to this special edition of the world. Well, as we go to air, China's Foreign Minister Wang Yi is continuing his extensive eight-nation tour of the Pacific, today arriving in Tonga. In sending its top diplomat, the Communist Party is demonstrating it is serious about establishing long-term strategic trade and security ties in the region. Its first efforts to sign a sweeping pact with 10 island nations has been shelved, with Pacific leaders saying they simply didn't have enough time to consider it properly. While Beijing's agenda may have been too hurried and ambitious, and it might be a setback for Beijing, most experts agree that China won't be deterred by this first rebuff. Our foreign affairs reporter Stephen Jejitz has been covering Wang Yi's trip and reports from the Fijian capital. Five countries down, three to go. Wang Yi arrives in Tonga, but China is still smarting after being forced to shelve its plan for a sweeping trade and security agreement with the Pacific. The parties agreed to continue positive and pragmatic discussions with a view to reaching more consensus. Pacific Island leaders say they felt rushed. We did not make a decision because the Pacific leaders have not had time to look at it. Pacific countries were sending their strong message about process, the way in which business is done in the Pacific, and also about their concerns around substance as well. But Beijing is not giving up, scrambling to produce a new Pacific position paper. And some of the most contentious elements of the deal, including around police cooperation and cyber security, are conspicuously absent. They have invested a great deal of diplomatic capital um, into this, and so I think we can expect them to keep pursuing it. There are some key elections approaching in the Pacific this year and China is looming as a major issue. Here in Fiji, the former coup leader and prime minister, Sitaveni Rambuka, is challenging Frank Bainimarama for the top job. Mr Rambuka was one of the officers who orchestrated Fiji's tilt towards China after 1987, when it was internationally isolated after the military coup. We had to survive. At the time... You are uh, in an open ocean. You want to clutch on to any raft that comes close to you. And that's how China came in. But these days, he's more uneasy about China and says if he wins power once again, he'll move Fiji closer to Australia and the West. I think we should uh, uh, ease off our relationship with China. Say, tell China, thank you very much. You've helped us in our times of need. Now we'll go back to our parents or to our, our brother. And that's the Pacific family. Stephen Jedgetts, ABC News, Suva. And we'll be crossing back to Stephen a little later in the program. Peter Harcher is the international and political editor at the Sydney Morning Herald. Peter, a first rebuff for this rather hurried uh, deal that China wanted signed. I imagine, though, that this is just the beginning of a push to get this done. Yes, it is. This is uh, part of a much longer term Chinese overarching strategy to develop dominance of the entire Indo-Pacific, of which the Pacific is a subset. Uh, the larger, longer plan was developed by Xi Jinping, president of China now, when he was still vice president. Um, he was the chair of the so-called small leading group within the Chinese Communist Party that drafted the plan for the South China Sea uh, expansionism and, and from there on. And so we now see this uh, arriving. We see this first attempt, as we just heard from your report, 
um, a very hasty and quite clumsy attempt at getting a pan-Pacific agreement with all of the 10 Pacific Island nations that recognise Beijing diplomatically. Uh, and it won't be the end, as, as the reporter just said. Um, the Chinese government has now taken a fallback to a position paper. But uh, while that may be considered a bit of a rebuff and a bit of a setback, uh, because Wang Yi, China's foreign minister, did not get the primary goal of this trip, uh, nonetheless, China did get a lot of um, other benefits and advances out of this trip. So if we hadn't been looking at this overarching pan-Pacific agreement that they were attempting to get, we would have paid a lot more of attention and it would have got a lot more headlines. The fact that China has just signed a security agreement with Samoa. Well, that's new. Uh, and 10 different agreements with Kiribati covering uh, things, including uh, renewing, rebuilding a World War II US-built airstrip on an island where only a few dozen people live. That's not to support a new and flourishing tourist route, uh, Bev. These are uh, Chinese, China's security interests coming to the fore, sometimes presented as civilian, uh, but always with dual use civilian military purposes in mind. So although at the overarching level it was a setback, uh, this was nonetheless quite a number of steps forward for China in the, sub in the, in the Pacific Islands. Mm. We'll come back to Peter in just a moment. But in his address to the second China-Pacific foreign ministers meeting this week, President Xi Jinping stressed that maintaining peace and stability in the Asia-Pacific and promoting the development and prosperity of all countries are a shared aspiration of the people in the region, as well as a common responsibility of regional countries. China has, of course, been developing economic and diplomatic ties with Pacific countries for decades. Yvonne Yong explains. China has had diplomatic relations with Pacific Island countries since the 1970s. Over the years, Beijing claims to have implemented more than 100 aid projects there, trained about 10,000 people in various fields and dispatched some 600 medical teams, including during the COVID pandemic. According to Chinese statistics, over the past 30 years, the total trade volume between China and Pacific Island countries has increased from $213 million to $7.4 billion. China spent hundreds of millions of dollars in financial aid and loans across the Pacific, with Papua New Guinea the biggest recipient so far, and a lot more promised if the Ramu-2 hydropower project goes ahead. Well, President Xi Jinping visited the South Pacific in 2014 and 2018, opening a new chapter in relations. It's being followed up by this current trip by Foreign Minister Wang Yi, who's meeting his Pacific counterparts from the 10 nations China has diplomatic relations with to enter what Beijing calls a new stage of rapid development. It's all part of the southward extension of the Belt and Road Initiative. Just last month, a China-Pacific Centre on Climate Change was officially opened in China's Shandong province. Also in April, Solomon Islands signed its security deal with Beijing, despite objections from Australia, the US, Japan and New Zealand, traditionally the main donors to Pacific countries. And in recent days, a deal has been agreed with Samoa to strengthen ties, as with Kiribati. And three agreements on economic development with Fiji have been made. Of course, all of this cooperation excludes Pacific countries, which still maintain ties with Taiwan. Yvonne Yong reporting there. Peter, let's come back to what you were talking about in terms of the types of investments and financial support that China has been providing. How does it differ from what Australia has done over the years? Well, there are a few differentiating points, Bev. Um, one is that there is an overwhelming dependence on infrastructure uh, as opposed to program support. So, uh, and, and, and look, Let's give China its due. Uh, it's very successful and very quick at building major pieces of infrastructure in a way that makes the Australian efforts and all other countries' efforts um, look pretty amateurish and lackadaisical. It builds big and conspicuous projects, roads and highways, airstrips and ports, parliaments and sports stadiums, big, conspicuous, expensive pieces of infrastructure. Um, and quickly. Another aspect is that the level of tied finance, loans um, that need to be repaid rather than grant aid is higher 
Um, overall, also the quantum, the total quantum of China's uh, aid or, or um, development budgets into the Pacific is a lot smaller than Australia's. Australia's remains dominant in the region. Last year, I think it was $1.4 billion and the new government of uh, Anthony Albanese has promised another half a billion dollars over the next four years to be added on to that. So, uh, and that dwarfs the Chinese, <clears throat> Chinese uh, scale. Um, one more characteristic um, I'd suggest, Bev, is, that, is the one that's uh, a lot harder to speak about. And that is, um, Australia has trouble matching uh, China in its ability to uh, put large amounts of um, unofficial off the books money into the bank accounts, offshore bank accounts of politicians. And Australia can't compete with that. But um, it's a characteristic where China can get a pretty high return for a relatively small investment. And of course, I'd imagine it makes it ultimately a lot harder to say no to China and what they want in terms of their ambitions in the region. Yes, it is. Once a, p a politician has taken the money, uh, they're pretty well owned because the disclosure of that, I mean, of course, they, uh, they're prone to blackmail as well as, um, as, as well as perhaps prone to future payments. So it's very difficult to defeat that. The best way to defeat that is relying on and supporting uh, the civil society mechanisms such as freedom of speech, freedom of the press, uh, free and open parliamentary systems that these countries all have. Um, which have already started to come under pressure from China and Australia and other democratic states and other Pacific partners can and should support and supplement um, those efforts. The, in, again, the incoming Labor government in Australia has said it will uh, improve the transmission of Australian news and information into the Pacific by giving the ABC another $8 million, uh, particularly for that reason. News and information, uh, journalism, uh, uncovering unsavoury truths and unpleasant bits and pieces at spread and butter for journalism and the Pacific Islands uh, have their own uh, outlets, their own journalism and all that needs to be supported and encouraged and uh, China's attempts to suppress them need to be resisted. Pete, we will uh, continue the conversation with you as we continue this uh, special coverage of our uh, China's involvement and push in the Pacific. Our foreign affairs reporter Stephen Jedgetts has been covering the Chinese foreign minister's Pacific tour from Fiji and he joins us now from Suva. Stephen, as we heard Peter talking about, of course, China may have been rebuffed on the, the multilateral deal, but they are getting incremental deals and the Wang Yi tour continues. Tonga has now just signed a deal with China. What does it cover? Uh, at this stage, Beverly, we simply don't know. It's been referred to as a cooperation agreement, but there are simply no details that have been provided beyond that. There are a few photos that have been put out on Facebook uh, and a few general lines, but what it actually amounts to and what it means remains a total mystery. Now, if it's anything like other legs of this trip, more details will drip out over time. I imagine before too long we'll get a slightly more detailed statement from the government of Tonga or perhaps from the Chinese foreign ministry laying out what this agreement may or may not mean. But at this stage, it's honestly difficult to say anything definitive about this agreement. And the secrecy surrounding it, the, the vagueness of the language uh, and the abstractness of, the, uh, of the, uh, the press releases put out has been pretty typical throughout this whole visit. We've seen an awful lot of photo ops, we've seen an awful lot of announcements signed or, or agreements signed, but we've seen, we've seen very few opportunities for journalists to actually ask hard questions or any questions of the foreign minister and almost no opportunities for the press to interrogate exactly what's happening. So what we see now is pretty much par for the course for Wang Yi's tour. Yeah. So, Stephen, try and break this down for us. There's been this, this mystery, this secrecy. It's been a very hurried tour. Um, despite the fact that we know very little detail, what is your impression of what has been going on behind the scenes? Well, it's safe to say that China has made steady to incremental gains, I think, as Peter said earlier, throughout this trip. We've seen a host of small or minor agreements signed. Of course, the main thing that China was after, which was this vast sweeping regional agreement, it hasn't achieved. 
Now, that's significant because China had clearly ploughed an awful lot of diplomatic capital and effort into trying to get this over the line. And the agreement that it was pursuing was truly vast in scale. Uh, we're talking about an agreement that would cover a whole range of areas, uh, ranging from cyber security to police training to pandemic management uh, to environmental practices. Uh, to infrastructure, even a free trade area. So the, the scope was truly remarkable. Now, China has fallen short on that. We saw yesterday Pacific Island nations saying essentially, no, we're not going to sign on. Too many people inside the Pacific community are uneasy about this, and some countries have clearly got deep reservations. So they've pressed pause on that for the moment. But China is signalling here that it's going to continue to press ahead for this deal, uh, that it's going to continue to press for this agreement. And in the meantime, it's signing a host of bilateral agreements across a whole range of areas. In Samoa, work, for example, on a fingerprinting lab for, uh, for, uh, for Samoa. Uh, in places like Kiribati, a whole range of agreements, 10 in total, touching on issues such as fisheries management as well as infrastructure development. Samoa, three agreements signed. So there has been progress here. Now, not all of this, of course, is inherently in any way suspicious or malicious. Some of these agreements may well be good agreements that provide public goods to these countries, but it does speak to the overall ambition and the ramping up of ambition from China, a desire to really cement themselves uh, and their security strategic links with a whole range of Pacific Island countries. And it's that broad-based desire that is really unnerving Australian authorities because they are not confident about China's intentions, they are not confident about China's trajectory, and they are not confident about exactly what these agreements might mean for the region. They're worried the Pacific Island nations might lose their sovereignty as a result of these deals. Yeah. And, you know, in terms of the way we've seen the Chinese officials control this tour and domestically in all these countries control the dynamics, where does it leave Canberra as, it, as a new government has to try and assess how it plays this game, which is essentially what it's become? Yeah, uh, and look, the, the media control in particular that's been exerted here has been really quite extraordinary. We've seen, you know, a number of really unfortunate, frankly, events uh, with the press essentially being either locked out or just simply kept at a distance, uh, prevented from asking questions. We first saw it in Solomon Islands where the press were told, look, we'll hold a press conference, but we won't allow you to ask any questions to Wang Yi, the Chinese foreign minister. They responded, understandably, by essentially boycotting that event. But it's not just Solomon Islands. We've also seen in Kiribati and Samoa, the, the press kept at a distance, not allowed to get anywhere close. Here in Fiji, the situation has been a little better, but not much. Uh, the, the press has routinely been met with a wall of either indifference or outright suspicion by Chinese officials. The ABC's camera a couple of days ago, uh, well, the Chinese officials essentially tried to keep it out of a meeting at the Pacific Islands Forum Secretariat. We saw a number of journalists essentially told they could come into an event before being blocked, we're told, on the request of the Chinese embassy. And then yesterday we saw, yes, a press event held by Frank Bani Marama, the Prime Minister of Fiji, and Wang Yi, the Chinese Foreign Minister, but no questions were permitted. I tried to throw a few questions to the Foreign Minister at the end, but uh, he simply ignored them. So there has been no opportunity so far for the press to, uh, to actually ask any questions of the Foreign Minister to perform their basic functions. And that is something that has stirred real frustration and anger in the media here in Pacific in the Pacific, which uh, regards, you know, this as a, as a real snub, and rightly so. Uh, and I think this is a trend that will continue throughout the rest of Wang Yi's tour. Stephen Jejitz in Suva, appreciate your time. Thank you so much. So, Peter, there we heard more of just the secrecy and the mystery surrounding this, but we know there is clear intent. The, the newly minted Foreign Minister, Penny Wong, took a very quick trip to Fiji ahead of Wang Yi's mission. How do you think that was received? Well, from the evidence that we see uh, reported back from the South Pacific, but also uh, from what Penny Wong has said to me, uh, it, the reception was pretty good. She said that there was some genuine enthusiasm, in her view, uh, about Australia's more active climate change policies under the new management, uh, and that the way that Australia was engaging was also welcomed. And while she didn't specify what that might have meant, I think it means that she turned up on day four of the in the life of the new government. Um, her, her predecessor, Maurice Payne, 
in three years had only made two trips to the Pacific uh, and visited three countries in those in those three years. Uh, Penny Wong, obviously, treating it as a high priority um, and offering an open hand, but also, uh, as I say, a more active climate change policy. Strikingly, with the in the meeting just yesterday where the Pacific uh, leaders met Wang Yi, China's foreign minister, Henry Puna, speaking on behalf, who is the Secretary General of the Pacific Islands Forum, speaking on behalf of all the Pacific nations, called on China to make deep and meaningful cuts to its carbon emissions and to submit a revised offer uh, to the international climate, next international climate conference to cut its emissions. Because as we know, Pacific Islands consider climate change and emissions to be an existential threat. So uh, they're putting some pressure back um, on China. And, you know, uh, one of the contrasts here is that Australia, even under the Morrison government, was still actually cutting its carbon emissions. China has never started cutting China uh, its uh, emissions and, in fact, has pledged to continue increasing emissions to 2030. The problem with Morrison's position, the Morrison government's position, was that it gave any country or Pacific country that didn't want to cooperate with Australia an excuse not to. The incoming Labor government's policy, because it is more active, uh, takes away that excuse and makes Australia a more inviting uh, uh, partner, but also makes it harder to come up with excuses why not to deal with Australia. And if I can just make a final point, Bev, because the point you make and that Stephen was making about the secrecy, the level of secrecy with which China deals in the Pacific and, and the lack of scrutiny, one Chinese priority that they have published in the so-called position paper that they put out today, which was their fallback from the overarching agreement they wanted with these countries. There's a critical clause there which says that uh, Beijing wants the Pacific Island governments to protect China's core interests. Their words, protect China's core interests. China's core interests uh, include, of course, uh, its its fanatical commitment to shutting Taiwan out, anything to do with Taiwan is a core interest. Um, and of course, core interests will also include China's security interests. And these, these are now public. That's, that comment is now public. Uh, that is what China wants. That is zero-sum stuff, as we were saying earlier. And, and that, is, that is what they're coming for. Well, the Chinese foreign minister's tour was boycotted by local media who say they are concerned by the lack of transparency and press access around the deal. Dorothy Wickham is a reporter in Honiara and a board member of the Media Association of Solomon Islands. Dorothy, good to have you with us. Um, you know, you have written that in all your years you've never experienced a foreign visit like this. Take us through how you felt about what took place in recent days? Well, I, I think uh, it's become obvious uh, that the way China deals uh, with its uh, partners is very different from other countries that Solomon Islands has diplomatic ties with. And uh, for restricting us uh, during that recent visit by the uh, Chinese foreign minister, Mr. Wang Yi, uh, the media association felt that we had to take action and make it known to our government that we weren't happy with them uh, not trying to push our case and to ensure that Solomon Island is aware of what was going on uh, during this visit. Have you before um, had a foreign country dictate terms in this way? I'm pretty sure when you have uh, meetings, uh, there's certain protocols that you go through, and I'm, I, I, I have seen that happen before. But when it comes to uh, a press conference, if called, then all media are invited to it. And uh, there is no limit to the questions, and our questions are not vetted. So this is the first time I've seen this. Do you feel that Solomon Islands uh, Prime Minister is going along with it and himself has become you know, angered by journalists and their questions? That's right. I think it's also our, our government uh, that's causing more of a problem. Uh, because they, they've had a, a rocky relationship with the media over the last five, six years now, I think. And I, I hope that they will change uh, this attitude towards the media because without uh, our, our population understanding what is going on, then uh, it might, you know, 
erupt into another riot again if we're not careful about how we handle the situation that we know. Mm. Dorothy, let's talk about Solomon Islands and the fact that they've changed their position, they've switched allegiance from Taiwan to China. How appealing is what China has on offer for, for local communities? Well, as you know, Solomon Islands has suffered uh, for quite a while now with bad roads, bad infrastructure, and uh, I think because we have a very young population now, uh, at the age of 30 down, it represents about 75% of our population. So our, our young ones are uh, feeling frustrated uh, because of the lack of development reaching the rural areas. Also, uh, it affects how they're able to get jobs, uh, go to school and just do whatever they need to do. So that's the sense of urgency that is affecting, I think, how government looks at the way it's dealing with uh, donor assistance now. So do you feel that a lot of uh, communities would go along with China investments and supporting what China's ambitions are in the region? Yeah, I, we've never had a big uh, social infrastructure put up like our national stadiums being built now by by the Chinese and, of course, other things that they'll be doing. I think they're also building uh, a new wing for the National Referral Hospital. And these are issues that so many Islanders have complained about for the last 15 years. So for when China jumped in and started making uh, uh, promises that they were keeping and straight away we could see it, that's actually changing uh, the mindset of uh, many Solomon Islanders. Mm. Dorothy, Australia has talked about expanding the labour schemes where, you know, people get a pathway to Australia to potentially even get residency down the track, but certainly visas to come and work. How appealing would that be compared to with what China has got on offer in terms of stadiums that perhaps may not necessarily be what the community needs right now? Well, like we all know, cash is, is power. And if they're able to earn uh, the kind of money that they can support and improve their lives in their villages and communities, of course, uh, this would boost uh, the interest by Solomon Islanders to to work in, in Australia. Uh, we've already seen it on the ground here, the impacts on a lot of families, the way their their family members are working in Australia and sending back money. They're able to start little businesses, build homes, send their kids to school. And it also would uh, have an impact uh, in the future in the way our, our people vote. Because as you know, in the past, a lot of our people depended on uh, members of parliament providing them housing, material, paying school fees and all these other basic necessary things that they need every day and even sometimes helping out with uh, medical expenses. So I think for once, Solomon Islanders will feel that they are contributing to something good. Uh, and it's a win-win situation for Australia and Solomon Islanders. We have the workers, you need the workers, and then it will give um, a sense of pride maybe back mm -hmm. to our young people if they're able to earn it. And Dorothy, you know, in terms of what China has put on the table towards Solomon Islands, you're talking about security, you know, telecommunications um, support, where in fact there may be concerns that China may want to influence, um, you know, what, what uh, information of Solomon Islanders. How far do you think the government is prepared to go? Well, uh, it'll, it'll depend a lot on... Uh, Solomon Islanders themselves demanding information and also demanding accountability in relation to whatever China is going to do in this country. And that's why, uh, as a as a body that represents the media, we felt strongly about this, that uh, our people needed to be informed and kept abreast of what was happening. Uh, because a lot of this, this development um, proposals, MOUs, will affect uh, Solomon Islanders because they are the land owners. They own the sea, they own the land. So it's important that they, they are aware of whatever government is, is agreeing to do. Mm. Dorothy, good to get your perspective and thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Peter, interesting, you know, we, we know, as you pointed out earlier, that Australia is trying to offer a, a range of other um, funding options and alliances with the Pacific. How key do you think the Labour promises and the route to Australia might be in terms of this 
this, this race with China? Well, it's pretty central. Uh, and the emphasis that the new government, the new Foreign Affairs Minister Penny Wong puts, is on making a uniquely Australian contribution. In other words, not trying to match what uh, China does and what China offers. Um, first, because, well, uh, the things that China can do, for example, those huge, quick infrastructure projects Australia has proved uh, inadequate at providing. Second, because some of them Australia just can't do, such as, uh, you know, backhanded payments to, um, to politicians. So uh, Wong's emphasis is on, as you've just been explaining, um, better access to Australian uh, visas, working visas, immigration and permanent settlement. For the first time, the Labor government has said for the first time, Australia will offer uh, a guaranteed 3,000 places a year within the overall migration intake to Australia, specifically for Pacific Island nations. Now, that's a very small figure within a much larger intake, and I'm assuming that they will increase that over time, and that, that's, a, that's the beginning of a pilot. But that is the sort of thing that China cannot offer, or if it does, cannot do well or attractively. Uh, but also um, other aspects uh, as well, Bev. So, for example, uh, genuine shared interests, the footy. Um, Penny Wong talks about improving uh, football club uh, con contest, competition, community re related, community level uh, contact. Uh, churches. Not, you know, not so many people in uh, China, not so many churches are allowed to function and exist. These are the sorts of things. Um, ed more, uh, more media-related uh, fellowships, training perhaps, scholarships. These are the sorts of things that Australia can offer and does, does pretty well that China can't. And that's front and centre of, uh, of what the, the new government in Australia is offering. They're also emphasising, Bev, Penny Wong has emphasised, she's used the line that Australian assistance comes without strings attached. Uh, just very, um, I was going to say delicately, but that's not delicate at all. <laughs> uh, very, very clearly delineating the difference with, with, between the Australian and Chinese offerings. Yeah. And, you know, it, it is a difficult one to fight against. Uh, at the end of the day, you, you know, we, we are now seeing far more clearly China's ambitions laid literally on paper. Can their ambitions and strategically how important the Pacific has been to the US and Australia, can they coexist, do you think? Well, the, if we put the welfare of the Pacific Islands people uh, at the centre, that can be win-win because Australia can contribute to that. Uh, the US, the French, the New Zealanders, they're all contributing. And the, and the Chinese government can contribute to that as well. Uh, that's a positive thing. Uh, some of these countries are the poorest in the world, among the poorest in the world. Some of them have lower incomes than sub-Saharan African countries. Uh, we have a moral as well as a geopolitical responsibility to improve the standing, development and life, life expectancy of these peoples. So that's where we can all converge in a positive way. But in terms of security rivalry, that's not win-win. That is zero sum. And uh, where the Chinese Communist Party is funding, uh, whether it's an airstrip or a port or a military training opportunity or whatever, that's a direct loss to Australia's interests. Uh, if there is a persistent Chinese military presence uh, granted on any of these islands, that moves China's nearest naval presence, uh, which is currently currently the nearest Chinese naval base, is 6,000 kilometres from Australia. Well, if they were to move one to, say, the Solomons, it would be less than 2,000 kilometres. So that's a 4,000 kilometre advance of Chinese military bases towards Australia, a direct intrusion uh, into Australian strategic hinterland. So that's where it becomes zero sum. Yeah. And do you think it is inevitable? We've seen how China is operating in other parts of the region. Do you think it's inevitable that they will mm -hmm. gain an upper hand in the Pacific? Well, they've already gained a lot of advantages and a lot of advances and through persistence and determination and sheer scale, uh, the sheer scale of uh, the amount of money and a volume of people uh, and the seamlessness with which the Communist Party uh, works with state-owned corporations and can command all those assets to serve the state in a way that Australia and other democracies just generally don't have. 
they will uh, they, they will continue to make advances. They will continue to erode Australia's security um, unless Australia can do two things. One, remain focused, committed and serious about this in a way we just haven't done before. Uh, and two, work with like-minded countries. The Japanese, the French, the New Zealanders, the Americans, they're all interested, they're all capable, they're all democratic, um, they're on the democratic team. So if we can do that, we have a chance, but otherwise um, we're guaranteed to lose this game. It's going to be a fascinating one to continue watching, no doubt. We will talk much more about it in the future. Peter, thanks so much for being part of this Pleasure discussion. And that wraps up our special coverage of China's push into the Pacific and the challenges that it'll continue to face into the future for Australia.